Good morning and welcome to the last uh, Physics 115 lecture of the semester. My name is Aka Daniel Ayangaka. And today we'll be concluding our series on nuclear physics. In particular, we'll be looking at the application of nuclear physics to medicine. As usual, if you are following along in the text, we'll be looking at section six of chapter 30 in the textbook. And of course, this is the outline of our discussion today. We will review briefly what we did in, in Studio 26 and then look at nuclear physics and medicine. So let's do this. Here is our first question. You have plutonium 238. The problem tells us that it decays to uranium 236 plus an alpha particle. And the question is, is this possible? Pause the video, take a minute, and say in grid scope and come back. The answer is no. For a particle, for, for a nucleus to decay by an alpha particle, the parent will have to be decreased. The mass number of the parent will have to be decreased by four because the alpha particle is a helium nucleus. It has two protons and two neutrons giving it a total A of four. Of course, you can see from here that the, the proton number, or what we call the atomic number, reduces by two to uranium, but the A number does not match. So the answer here is false. The actual, the actual solution is actually provided here, all right? So for a particle to emit an alpha particle, an alpha particle is just helium two, if you write it this way. And so if you do the math, if you balance both the right and the left-hand side, you notice that this equation is not correct. All right, let's move to the next one. What is the daughter nucleus of the following decay process? Again, pause the video, answer in grade scope and come back. All right, now, what is this decay here? This is what we call a beta minus decay. That means I am taking a neutron and converting it into a proton. This is, this is what we have. This is the process that is happening here. We have P plus an electron, okay? If I have a situation like this, that means I am increasing my atomic number by one. but the mass number remains the same because all I'm doing, the mass number A, remember, is equal to Z plus N. All I'm doing, I'm removing, I'm just transforming a neutron into a proton. So A remains the same, but Z increases by one. So the correct answer here would be yttrium 90. And of course, the explanation is also provided there. One more question. I have a sealed box that is completely evacuated. This is a perfect vacuum. Then I place 1 million beta decay radio, radioactive atoms in it. And we know that their half-life is two days. After four days have passed, how many atoms are in the box? Again, take a minute, answer in grade scope and come back. This we're told has a half-life of two days. We want to know how many of these atoms remain after four days. This is tricky. The answer is T, one million. Because the atoms are not destroyed in a radioactive decay, they only transform from one type of atom to another. The problem is asking us to just count the number of atoms in the box, not distinguishing between what they are. Right, so the answer is T, one, uh, one million. All right, this is what we did in our last class. We, we said that if a nucleus is unstable, it undergoes a process we call a radioactive decay. And from the analysis we did in the last class, we showed that this decay is exponential. Now for an exponential decay, we, we made an analogy to um, our RC circuit where the, the voltage or the charge on the, on the capacitor decays exponentially. And so we said that if you are starting with n number of nuclei 
at the particular time t equal to zero. After a time t, you will have this number here that the number remaining is related to the, the number that you started with according to this expression here. So t here is just the time that gives me n. And of course, tau is the time constant, okay? The time constant here is the time it takes for the number n naught to drop to n, to drop to e to the power minus one. This is about 36 point something percent, okay? And then of course, we can then relate our time constant to the half-life, the time taken to half, for half of this near the original nuclei to decay. It's given by this expression here. The, the time constant is just 1.44 times the half-life of uh, uh, decaying nucleus. We, we also said that because we don't always know when to start counting, a better quantity to use is the activity. The activity is just the number of disintegrations per second, right? And this is easy to do. Even if I don't know my, the original number of um, uh, nuclei that are there, I can just bring my detector around. And so if this particle is, if, if this is a better decay uh, sample, I will just count the number of beta decays and uh, the, the number of electrons or positrons that are emitted for a given time I can calculate the activity of this source. So it's an easier quantity to deal with than using the number, the initial number and all of that. And of course the activity now relates to the uh, number at any given time to the time constant by this, or of course you can then relate it all the way to the initial number, the number at the beginning. Now, of course, N naught over tau is what we call the initial activity. The activity as well behaves like uh, our, the relationship we had in the RC second. So we can write it in the same form as an exponential decay. R is equal to R naught e to the negative T over tau. All right, that is what we did in our last class. Now we come to today's class. And before we start discussing uh, the main topic of today, we we'll just have to note a few things here, that the energies of the alpha particle and beta particles, gamma rays and all of that are typically in the range of 0.1 to 10 MeV. And of course, if you do the conversion here, you have, you know that one MeV is 1.6 times 10 to the power of that. Now these energies are much, much higher than the ionization energy of atoms and molecules. Now the point here is that our, our bodies are made up of atoms and molecules, right? For you to ionize, that is to knock off an electron from a, a neutral atom, you need just a few electron volts of energy to do that. So if I shine a, a, a source of radiation on a molecule that has energy more than this few MeV, I'll be able to ionize that. And so we'll have to find a way of defining this quantity. So we say here that the very large doses of ionizing radiation can break bonds and lead to cell death, right? Because if a cell is neutral and I'm able to knock off the electrons, I create some radicals in, in, in the system. And then of course, if I have radicals, they will start reacting with each other, right? And this will lead to dirt out of that, okay? So in, in nuclear medicine, uh, we use uh, different uh, techniques to, 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 to solve problems, okay? Now, we'll be focusing mainly on, on two things today, uh, nuclear medicine and nuclear imaging. Now, nuclear medicine is the use of radiation to treat uh, brain tumors and cancerous cells, okay? So here we're showing a picture of, um, I think we'll come back to this, this picture later on. This is someone that probably has a brain, a, a, a brain tumor. And instead of surgically operating to remove this tumor, the easiest thing to do is to uh, shine a beam of gamma rays, uh, in this case, to that very spot, right? Gamma rays, as we will note later in this lecture, that 
uh, rapidly changing uh, uh, rapidly changing cells are more susceptible to radiation damage, right? Because they are changing very quickly. Radiation can easily damage them. And that is the property of tumors and cancerous cells. And so if I'm able to shine a beam of gamma ray on a tumor, right? Then I can destroy, I can either shrink it or destroy it completely. So what this lady, this woman is wearing here is called a collimator, is able to collimate, to locate, to pinpoint the location of a tumor. And of course, we will later on discuss, uh, discuss how to locate the position of a tumor in the body, right, using the imaging. I use nuclear imaging to locate this, this tumor and then use gamma ray to kill it. All right. Now, other tumors are treated by surgically implanting low energy uh, uh, radioactive seeds within, within the tumor. So instead of shining a beam of gamma rays or radiation on a tumor, we can uh, surgically implant seeds. And then these seeds will emit radiation that will, will kill this, this, this tumor. Okay? All right. Let's, let's look at this problem here. Now, patients with Graves, uh, what is called Graves' disease have an overactive thyroid gland. A common treatment uses radioactive iodine, which is taken up by the thyroid. The radiation emitted in its decay will damage the tissue of the gland. A single pill is produced in the lab with four times 10 to the 14 atoms of the isotope iodine-131, which has a half-life of eight days. Okay, here's the question. Although the iodine peel, the iodine in the peel is constantly decaying, it is still usable as long as it contains at least 2.5, 10 to the 14, uh, one uh, iodine-131 atoms. What is the maximum delay before the peel is no longer usable? So how much time we have to last between production and when it's uh, supposed to be used. Okay. Take a minute, answer this question. I will get back to it. All right, let's look at this. We are, we are given the number. So in this problem, this is our N naught. This is the one that is produced. And I have my T half the half-life is known. And so I start with N naught. How long will it take for this thing to drop to N? This is my N, all right? So we can go ahead and calculate this as shown here on the next page. So I use my uh, radioactive decay law. Of course, I've already identified my N and my N naught, right? I also have an expression for T, uh, T half, the half-life of this. I can just rearrange this. Remember in the last class, we used the law of uh, logarithms to, to, to change this. So now you can also use this method here where you just take the natural log on both sides of this and use the property of log. So if I have log A to B, this tells me that I can write it as B log A, right? This is what we applied here to bring us down here, right? So if I take the natural log of uh, one half to this power here, then I can just write is the natural log of N over N naught is equal to the natural, uh, I can, is equal to T over T half natural log of one half, right? I just canceled this here, okay? because this is raised to a certain power, I just move the power backward here. And then of course I'm looking for T, so I'll just multiply by T at, by the half-life divided by uh, the natural log of one over two. I plug in the numbers and I say that it's 5.4 uh, days. Okay, all right. Now, you notice that we say we can treat tumors in the, in the body by given a certain amount of radiation. But like any other practice in medicine, we have to be able to know how much dose it's safe. How much of radiation can we give a body in order to kill a tumor and still maintain good cells around it, 
right? So here we will define what is called a dose because we know that the biological effects of radiation depends on two things, how much energy a particular tissue absorbs and how that tissue reacts to different forms of radiation, right? So we we'll start with the first one, how much energy is absorbed? The energy that is absorbed is uh, kind of defined in the context of a dose. So we define a dose as the amount of energy that is absorbed in a unit of a tissue, a unit kilogram of a tissue, right? Here is defined as energy from ionizing uh, radiation absorbed by the kilogram of a tissue, right? So this is energy of a mass, right? So dose, if, you, if you're going to write this down, the dose is equal to the energy, this will be in joules over the mass, right? In kilogram. This is how we calculate the dose. And of course the unit J, uh, the joules per kilogram has a very convenient name. The SI unit for this is the gray, abbrevi abbreviated as GY, okay? So one GY, is equal to and just one and joule per kilogram, right? So now we said that the amount of energy that is absorbed also the tissue reacts differently to different forms of radiation. So for instance, if I give um, a, a, a particular tissue, let's say a one gray of gamma ray radiation and one gray of uh, beta radiation, tissues will react differently to that, right? Even though the dose is the same. So we have to come up with a way of differentiating between these two uh, uh, types of radiation. So we'll define what is called the relative biological effect effectiveness. That is um, how different cells react to different types of radiation. Okay, so this is relative to the biological effect. So we define it to the, uh, with relative to the biological effect of an equal dose of X-ray. But all that is happening here is that we're trying to distinguish between the different impacts of different radiation, right? And now if we then define the relative biological effect effectiveness, we then define what is called the dose equivalent. Now the dose equivalent Dose equivalent is just, it's given in this expression here, is the dose in grays times the RBE, the relative biological effectiveness of particular radiations. And we'll define this in, in, the, in the next page, okay? Now, the dose, remember the dose itself, it's in gray, right? Another unit for gray, uh, for, for dose is, is, is the rad. Now the dose equivalent, remember that the dose equivalent, now you are taking into account the differences between the biological effects of different radiations. And that is measured in, in sieverts, SV, right? Another unit that we can use for dose equivalent is the REM. So we have the different conversions here. For, for this is the dose and this is the dose equivalent. All right, and of course, if so, one um, uh, one gray is just equal to one thousand rad, and of course, uh, one silver is equal to one hundred rad. The different units. So we can this. These are the SI units, but we also use these units as well. This is SI. This is SI for our calculations. So in most cases, when we give you um, uh, problems, you have to convert them to SI units before. We go ahead and do this. Now let's look at this problem. Uh, a patient receives a can of his liver. We are told that he ingests 3.7 mega becquerel. This is the activity. Becquerel is the unit of activity. So 3.7 mega becquerel of 198 gold, gold 198, which decays with a 2.7 day half-life by emitting a, a 1.4 mega electron volt beta particle. Medical tests show that 60% of this isotope is absorbed and retained by the liver. What is the dose equivalent received 
by the patient's um, 1.5 kilogram liver once all of the atoms have decayed. So we want to calculate the dose equivalent. Now, I'll just write this here, dose equivalent is equal to the dose times the RBE, where we know that the dose here, the dose itself is the energy over the mass. All right, we're given the mass of the liver. Now we have to calculate, the first thing we have to do here is to be able to calculate the energy because what is, we're told that these are beta particles, RB for beta particles is here, okay? We have everything we need. We also have the mass. This mass here has given us 1.5 kilogram. So in this problem, all you need to do is to find a way to calculate the energy that is uh, absorbed by the liver in this problem, okay? Because the dose is the energy absorbed per unit mass. All right. This is a classroom problem, so take a minute, work on this, pause the video, work on it, answer in grade school, and then we'll continue. All right, now, like I said, the biggest issue here is to cap is calculating this energy. How do we go about calculating the energy absorbed by the liver? Now let's go back to this. We're given a, a, a source of radiation. We're given the activity of that radiation, right? And it decays with this half-life. Now, what is the activity? The activity is the number of disintegrations per second. So if I know the half-life and I know the activity, I should be able to calculate the number, right? And then we're told that each, every one of these atoms or nucleus emits a gamma ray, a beta particle with an energy of 1.4 MeV. So all I need to do here is to get how many beta particles are coming out of the system. We can calculate the total number of nuclei that are decaying, but we are told that almost 60% of this is absorbed by the liver. Okay? Now, so the first thing to do here, let's, let's calculate how many atoms of uh, 198 gold did the person ingest, okay? Now, we know how this works. Um, what is this? Did I skip? All right, this is what we have. We're given that the activity is this. I know the activity, R is 3.7 times 10 to the power six decays per second. I also am given the, the, the half-life. I can convert this to seconds because that is the SI unit of time. The conversion is provided. And then I use the fact that my activity is related to the number of these atoms by this relationship here, right? So I have my activity is given. I have my half-life is given in, in seconds. And then of course, the natural log of two. I now know that this, uh, there are about 1.24 times 10 to the power 12 atoms that are decaying in this case. Now, out of this number, the problem tells us that it is only 60%. So the question is how much energy is deposited by uh, the decay of these atoms, deposited by the decay of these atoms retained, is retained by the liver. The problem tells us is that it's only 60% of this. So if I calculate, now, if, if you go back to this here, this is the number of atoms, right? And I, I come back to this here. Now, if I have the number of atoms, I will just have to multiply that number. So let me copy this, what is this here? This is 1.24, 10 to the power 12. So 1.24 times 10 to the power 12. Okay, 1.24 times 10 to the power 12 of this. 
And now these are the number, this is N, okay? Now each of these has an energy of 1.4 uh, mega electron volt. So what is the total energy? I'll just multiply this by 1.4 MeV, okay? If I multiply this by 1.4 uh, MeV, now I want to convert this, this will give me the energy because this is just a number. I multiply this two here, gives me the energy in MeV. I convert that to, to joules. You see this expression here, but the one that is how much is absorbed and retained by the liver is only 60%. So it's just 60% of this quantity. And the correct answer would be with this. So this is what we have. So we have this here. First of all, you multiply this by the 60%. I think you decided to do it this way. You have this. And then of course, uh, 1.4 MeV corresponds to this amount of energy. And if you then um, do the conversion, you have 0.166, like that. Okay. Now, now, what is the dose equivalent? So now that is, this is the energy. All of this is just calculating the energy that is as of. Now the steps again, I'll, I'll just remind you with this. Um, you, you started with the uh, R, R leads you to N. You use N to calculate the energy. But of course you have to take 60% of this energy and this energy will have to be in, in joules. You will do this here. And this brings you to this point. Now, this is the energy. But the problem asks you initially to calculate the dose equivalent. Remember, the dose equivalent is the dose times RBE. Dose itself is the energy deposited divided by the mass. So this is what we're doing here. The dose equivalent is dose times RPE. Those, uh, the dose is energy absorbed divided by the mass. And, and so that means that uh, 0.17 joules absorbed by one kilogram of this is equal to 0.11 gray. It's just this number divided by this one here would be 1 point, 0 0.11. That is your uh, dose. And of course the RPE for, part, uh, for beta particles is one. So you just multiply that by one. Okay, and so we, we, we have already gone through by this, uh, through, through this year, I just repeated this again to show that in nuclear medicine, um, tumors and cancer cells are more susceptible to radiation damage. So this is what we talked about initially, but I added another picture here. So uh, you can either shine a beam of radiation to a particular spot in the body to kill it, or you can implant what is called radiation seeds. So here, this person has, uh, this is a uh, cancer of the scrotum. And so you implant uh, radiation seeds and then they, they emit radiation that kills that in the body. It, it's the same thing here. All right, now, the last thing we consider in today's class is imaging. How do you locate the, uh, locate, uh, let's say, uh, cancerous cells in the body, tumors in the body using nuclear medicine. The difference here, uh, we'll look at nuclear imaging. The difference here, look at this here, you, x-rays is also radiation. The x-rays is external to the body, right? So when you take an x-ray picture, what you're seeing, you're looking at mostly the bones, whether a bone is broken or something like that. In nuclear medicine or in nuclear imaging, what you're doing is that the radiation is coming from the inside. And what this reviews is the biological activity, what is going on within the body. X-rays don't tell you that. Nuclear imaging provides that kind of information, right? They provide a kind of a, um, what we call an image of the biological activity of the tissues within the body. And for this, in most cases, we ask, we give a patient some radiation they inject, and then we use a camera to, to measure the, uh, the radiation that is emitted by the pill that you swallow. So nuclear medicine, um, so a, a, a particular example is this technician 99, he decays by emitting a very peculiar gamma ray. So if you 
For instance, if if, if a body is uh, ingests a particular um, radioactive seeds, remember that if I ingest a technician ninety nine, it has this affinity to go to the bones or in areas where the cells are, are changing very rapidly. This is a good thing about this particular uh, uh, nucleus, that it goes to either to the bones or where the cells are developing or changing very quickly. And it's good for cells because uh, tumors are always are changing very fast compared to how every other cell in the body is um, changing. So if you uh, take in uh, technician 99, it will deposit mainly in places where the cells are changing rapidly. And so for instance, if you have something in your throat, like here, that this particular technician will be deposited there and then you just tie emitting this radiation. Then I have a, a gamma camera that is indicated here. Now, what you see here is that this camera is designed in such a way that it measures radiation that is coming directly towards it, right? If it comes from an angle, it blocks it so it would not take an image from here or this three rays here. It's the one that is directly in this camera here that you'll be able to do. So I can use this, process this image and make an, uh, process the, the signal that I receive here and to make an image, I'll be able to see something that looks like this. Okay, now, of course, this picture here shows these are regions where um, the cells are changing very rapidly in the throat and maybe something's happening here in the shoulder and all of these other places. So this uh, enables you to locate um, tumors in the body very quickly. So for our, our last activity in the class today, let's look at this problem. Um, Strontium 85 is a short-lived has a half-life of 65 days isotope used in bone scans. A typical patient receives a dose of uh, 85 with an activity of 0 0.10 millicurie. How much time has passed until the activity has decreased to 0 0.02 millicurie? Again, this is, a, this is a very easy problem. So I'm starting with this activity here. So I will say this is my R naught. I'm looking at this is my R. I have my T half. I'm looking for T, my time. Okay. We have an expression that says something like this. R naught is this here over tau, or you can do um, R is equal to R naught into one over two, um, T over T half. Okay, and either one of this, we give you uh, the same answer. So if we come here, we're using the second one. So I have my R, my R naught, I have my this here, I'm looking for my time. I take the ratio and divide two by R naught to bring it on this side. And of course that will be 0.2. Then I take a natural log on both sides and I calculate this to be 150 days. This concludes 